Uh, continuing on uh, with slavery in the Bible, and specifically we're discussing slavery in the Old Testament, I want to turn my attention to legal status. And um, just quoted two passages, uh, Deuteronomy 10.19 and Leviticus uh, um, 19.34, basically um, pointing out the fact that, that foreigners were to be treated the same as Israelites. And this included both uh, Hebrew and foreign slaves. Um, basically, what I want to do now is turn my attention to the notion of property. Since we're discussing legal status, I think this is a, an appropriate place to discuss this. Uh, slaves were considered property in exclusion to their humanity. That is, to stab a slave was like stabbing a pumpkin, not like stabbing a human. Unlike slavery practiced in Egypt and in, in Antebellum America, where there were no legal or ethical demands upon the owners as to how they treated their property, uh, under Mosaic Law, slaves were considered human beings with rights. So under the Mosaic Law, slavery was consensual for both the Hebrew and the foreigner, and slaves had rights, and they were to be treated as humans. If a slave was mistreated, he or she was granted their freedom. Exodus 21, verses 26-27. Slaves were considered as managed human resources. Okay, uh, Much like modern-day companies, uh, actually, they actually use that term nowadays, uh, uh, managed human resources. That's what slaves were considered. In other words, the master owned the labor, not the person. Slaves were not thereby, thereby rendered disposable non-human goods. They were still legal agents. This included foreign slaves as well. And, and in the culture, and their masters were legally accountable, um, were legally accountable for how they treated their slaves. God expected Israel to treat foreign slaves with the same humanity and respect that was rendered to the Hebrews. And I would like to add that this is how uh, I find it fascinating that skeptics often cherry pick scripture. You know, they're pretty quick to point out Leviticus 25, 44 through 46, and I've already discussed that at length, by the way, um, and discussing uh, how it actually hurts the skeptic argument. If you haven't seen that yet, I would, I would back up and maybe look at some of the other videos previous to this one. But I think it's fascinating that oftentimes they skip over verses 39 through 43, and it says, and if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve you as a slave, but as a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve you into the uh, year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and he shall return to his own family, and he shall return to the possession of his fathers. For they are my servants, whom I have brought out of the land of Egypt, and they shall not be so sold as slaves. You shall not roll, roll, over, roll over them with rigor, but you shall fear your God. These verses clearly demonstrate when coupled with verses such as Leviticus 25:23, which states, The land should not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you, you are strangers and sojourners with me. It should, be clearly, it should be, become clear what is meant by property. It becomes evident that the tenants and masters were held accountable to God for the treatment of the land and the people. In the case of the land, there were numerous prescriptions by God uh, for them, and in the case of the servants, there were likewise guidelines and limitations upon the practices. Property is therefore seen not as own disposable goods, but as economic output or labor. The property was the labor, not the person. And again, to support this, I would encourage you to look at Leviticus 25, verses 14 through 16, Exodus 21, 18 through 19, and Leviticus 25, verses 43, 49, I'm sorry, 49 through 53. In exchange for the labor, the master was to care for the needs of the slave. In keeping with the variableness of the notions of property in the ancient, in the ancient Near East, as noted by historians and anthropologists, Israel's notion of property was, severe, was a severely restricted one, and one that did not preclude the humanity of the servant, nor absolve the master from, the, from legal accountability. Finally, both types, Hebrew and foreign slaves, were domestic slaves living in their, their owners' homes, and in many cases became family members not members of slave gangs working in plantations like the vast majority of slaves in pre-Civil War America. Um, these notes were taken from the Jewish Study Bible uh, and specifically uh, discussing Exodus 21. Uh, quoting from a history of Na uh, Near Eastern law, a better uh, criteria for legal definition of slavery is its, is, is, is its property aspect. Since persons were recognized as a category of property that might be owned by private individuals, a slave was therefore a person to whom the law of property applied rather than family or contract law. Even this definition is wholly exclusive, 
since family contract law occasionally intruded upon the rules of the ownership. Furthermore, the relationship between the master and the slave was subject to legal restrictions based upon the humanity of the slave and the concerns of the social justice. A less dramatic illustration of this might be in a modern uh, might be in the modern acquisition of one business by another business. I, the employee, a bundle of, of all my workplace obligations, the contract under which I work, the values I'm supposed to uphold, the relationships I have with my co-workers at my office, my skills, my organizational knowledge, my career path in the firm, is sold to another owning group, a competitor, maybe a private investor, Wall Street, etc. This in case is a property aspect to my life at the office. This does not mean, of course, that my family status as a dad is changed or that I cannot vote in my country. My role or my identity as a private worker would thus be sold, transferred, and even inherited if the firm was privately owned and the owner died with the successor. Our legal system recognizes this in many, many contracts under the heading of successors and as assigns. But where, wherever I went, the state, would still, still, the state would still see me as a human and prevent, as in ancient Near Eastern culture, my owner from killing me. Now, continuing with legal status, slavery as we know it, Slaves could not have their own property. All that that belonged to them belonged to their owners. Under Hebrew slavery in the Old Testament, servants obviously could have their own property. The purchase price of the servanthood belonged to them before they used it to buy their freedom or their, or their land back. Uh, slaves could prosper and buy their own freedom, as already mentioned. They maintained any family property they had before they entered into the uh, servant relationship. They, they, could not, they could own their own slaves, this included foreign slaves, and in fact foreign slaves could own Hebrew slaves, Leviticus 25 verses 47 through 55. Uh, slaves were allowed to participate in the feast, Deuteronomy uh, 12 verses 11 and 14, and all of them rested on the Sabbath day, Exodus 29, Exodus 23, 12, and Deuteronomy 5, 13. We don't have a lot, of, uh, a lot of data on this, but we do have additional data that indicates that servants, were, that servants could accumulate property. Quoting from the Anchored Bible Dictionary, naturally there were a certain number of privileged uh, serv uh, uh, servants and slaves. Thus, according to 2 Samuel 19.17, Zeba, uh, a slave of Saul's family, had 15 sons and 20 slaves. To judge from Leviticus 25 verses 47 through 50, some slaves of Hebrew origin could have raised the means in order to purchase their freedom. Uh, now what I would like to do in the next video is I would like to turn our, t our attention to treatment of slaves. Thank you.